today we are talking about building a component library, uh, especially using SDC. Uh, my name is Robert Ngo. Uh, I'm a solution architect at Evolving Web. Uh, I have been working with Evolving Web for more than five years, and I'm doing back-end and front-end and software in DevOps. Uh, about Evolving Web, so we are a um, full service agency in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Uh, so we uh, offer solution in Drupal and WordPress. Uh, here are some of our clients. We work mostly with uh, the government of Canada, uh, higher education, and uh, some uh, uh, tourism uh, companies. So here are some of our project. This is um, a travel portal for Quebec uh, province. This is for the University of uh, OCAP in, in Toronto. And this one is uh, my current baby, uh, which is an insurance company in Quebec. Uh, so today we are talking about um, the component library, what it is, what we need. Uh, we talk a bit about SDC. I, I will not go uh, much into the technical part of the SDC. Uh, and then but just more about like how we structure the component, how we keep it even along the way with the project, and how to maintain it. And lastly, we'll talk a bit about the QA, if not a question and answer, it's about like you know, testing and managing the, the, the quality of the product. Uh, component library. So this is just a definition straight out from Wikipedia. So uh, recently we have um, more big client who have uh, the need to build a design system. They are big organization, they want to maintain their branding consistency in across multiple website, multiple department. So they need a design system. So design system basically need two parts, maybe more than two parts. But it's more about the reusable component, where it's a part of code that you can just put it in, put it in data, and you need to render in a specific way. And the second part, which I deem out here, is a standard where of those components. How does it look like? How big is the margin of the button or the padding of the button? But this part will be more with the designer. And we will have another talk at the Drupal Camp New Jersey in the next three weeks about that. So uh, today, I will just focus on the first part, where we do the reusable component library. <coughs> Uh, so first, uh, we talk about SDC. SDC is quite a hot topic right now with uh, going into car, a new way to tuning in Drupal to make everything easier to reuse component, easier to test it. So we try to use it. And this is a very simple example of a car. And uh, let's say the designer come to us and say they want something like this. But this, um, the developer, we would will, we will sit down and analyze what we need in this component. We need an image in there, a title, a text, and then a link. A link will be, will be an object of a text and a URL. So that is the first impression of this component. And then we, um, we turn it into an SEC component. Uh, can you see it here, or is it too attractive? <laughs> So, so basically, the, uh, the skeleton of the skeleton of an SDC is made up of a uh, schema written in YAML file that you can see on the left here. We on the top view, and you can see that the image URL text those are on the top view that we highlight from the component on the previous slide. And on the right hand side, we have the, the truth marker of that component. And Basically, you can see that the image URL right print out over here. We have the link URL print out over here. And then uh, the good thing about SDC is that you can reuse some component. And we can see here in the last part, we can include the link component, which is another component in there, so that we don't need to style it uh, in, this, uh, in this card component. And this the code that I, I write in here is with Calvin. So, you can see some familiar class over there. And uh, what it right now uh, at the DOOM structure is like, we have the data structure, data component ID, which is the card over here. And then in this part, it will be the link component over here. And 
there's one there's one important thing that we found along the way developing it is we set the convention to one of our developer to only add the attribute on the top class uh, on the top on the top level of the component here because what if there is a, it will add the data component ID over here and it will be the next day of the module of the team where you define the component and then this is the name of the component it might not be useful for now but if we go into the test phase where we want to do some automated testing this can be used as a selector so that you can go and test that component so we try to keep that convention uh, so that is the, 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 the short introduction of the SDC. Uh, so now we, uh, we go into building the component library. We build a website. We want to have a set of uh, button, of primary button, secondary button, and we have different style of link. We uh, want to have the hero component. We want to have the accordion component. So we think about it like building a workshop where you have multiple type of t-shirt type pant, and we can match it together to have different outfit. Uh, in, in, in most projects, we will be able to have, we will have the privilege to build a component library from scratch. So that is a, the first case, the easy case. You know, everything is new. Uh, we don't have any limitation. There is no regression to, to, to handle. And it's easy to think about a test strategy for a component library in this case. But it's also come with some challenge step. Like, everything is new. We don't have the global view on how the component library will evolve in the next one or two years. Uh, the naming that we put on this component right now doesn't make any sense in the next six months. For example, we have um, a hero for a car product. So we just named it hero car. And then six months later, the, the designer will come back and say, I want to make the same hero, but for motorcycle. But we reuse the similar look, but change a few things. So that turned out to be a bad name to put into the hero. Uh, and so, so this is an example that I just mentioned. So this is the hero that we have. And this is the hero for the insurance product for car. And we also highlight on the property that we need for this component. And this will be in the Powercraft Hero component where we call that SAC. And just it will render it like this. Like, like I said, a few months later, the designer will come back and they say, OK, and we need this part to be like this. This is the additional to the stuff. So what will happen if we reuse the existing component library, and the, the, the component hero that we have on the previous slide? How do we handle this one? Do we add a new prop for the project here? Do we add a new prop for the horizon here? It doesn't make sense because if we add a new prop here, then the, all the component that doesn't need this prop, it's, it just, the, it's just not, not clean to have that. Uh, so the question that we only have is like, how do we not turn our component into having too many properties for nothing and try to fit with so many scenarios, or how we not turn our component library into a mess because we're just duplicating it. We don't want to turn the, uh, the hero for the car into the hero and, and copy it and make it into the hero for the motorcycle. So it's like it's, we need to find a middle way in, in between of those. And how do we handle that? Um, the best way is to have a global view on what is going on in our current library. <coughs> How many components we already have? If we put a new attribute in there, it will affect this component, that component, in that scenario or not. So we use a tool, uh, Storybook, uh, which is, uh, I think, very popular. It's just a tool where we can visualize existing component. It's a Node.js application, so it's totally separate from Drupal. So, with Storybook, what if there is a, so this is the previous, before Storybook. Let's say we have a slide with a 1,000 page, 2,000 page, and we have a paragraph hero, and we have a few hundred page with that paragraph hero. And after two or three years, we have so many variants of that hero. It can have an image, it can have a text, it can have some few missing in this variant or not. 
and uh, for uh, along the way we find for example this one when we have an image over here which is 50 50 it will be a bit too close to the next we want to adjust for that case only or uh, we can see we can extend it to be a bit bigger how does it look like in mobile so that kind of situation that we happen when the project go for for long for two or three years and uh, before storybook if we want to see the, the, the current state of this paragraph, we need to look for the page where it render and verify it. So sometimes it's very time consuming. So with Storybook, we will have another site, another <coughs> website here, where we can define this is how all the variant of the hero will look like. And uh, with, with Storybook, we can write different story. The story here is like, I want a story of this component where it doesn't have an image. I want another story where it doesn't have a CTA or a text over here. And it will render out with the dummy content that we want. And if we want to use the real content in there, we can just easily change the content to see how it's look like. And there's some button over here where we can see how this component looks like in mobile view, in tablet view, and desktop view. So much easier to test it. and. And, and, and verify everything. And even cooler that the, the story will come with many add-ons. One of these add-ons is that uh, it can allow you to do, the, it, it allow us to run accessibility testing on this component. You see, okay, this tag is um, with a good contrast, so it passed, or the other tag is too small, too, too hard to read. So that kind of uh, benefit we can get from story book. This is outside of Drupal context. So this is all the variant or the story that we uh, we develop along the way. Before going to this slide, there's one note about Storybook. Uh, like on Drupal.org, when we read the documentation of uh, SDC, we will find many articles mentioned that how to write the SDC and how to write the story of the SDC using YAML format. And because that is very familiar with all the developers. But I went with Storybook before and writing story in JSX, in JavaScript, it's much more efficient and much more um, powerful in the way where you can provide default content, uh, uh, W content in this component programmatically. With, with JavaScript, we can do much more than just, um, just YAML file. So it turned out we shift into writing all of the story in, in JSX. And one thing is like in, 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 in SEC documentation, uh, when we declare the, the, the YAML file of the component, uh, we have the example uh, attribute. Maybe I can come back. Uh, over here. So uh, according to the document of the SDC, uh, we can type like title here, and then we have exam, and then we can put some random dummy string in there. But in the SEC, it doesn't do anything. If we write, but if we write the story in JSX, we can basically tell JavaScript to read that line and put it into the story so that you don't need to invent another dummy content for the storybook. Uh, so that is the first part. That is the easy part where we have the privilege to do everything from scratch. But uh, Sometimes we have a big project that has been done for, uh, for many years, with, for example, my, my project that I'm working on. Uh, it has been developed for, for long before SDC, and now we have the need to make all the sub-site, more than my, micro site, need to turn it into a micro multi-site uh, setup. And they need to maintain the branding consistency, and they need to uh, revamp the front-end part, changing things here and there. And we think that it makes more sense to turn it into a component library so that it can reuse across multiple sites. Uh, so that comes with quite a lot of uh, uh, things that we need to solve. But firstly, it, it's, uh, it's easy for us because we kind of know pretty much all the existing components that we have in the system. So the, the, the landscape of the component is mature already. We know that we have five type of hero, we know that this type of hero can have this kind of variant. So so it's easier for us as a developer to spend to, to plan for the, the, the component. 
points. And it's also easy to define the prop and the slot. We kind of know what will happen with them. But the problem is like for legacy project, a component can have dependency on other stuff. So we need to cut them off without breaking the site. So we need to manage them uh, properly. And when we change from the, 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 the classic teaming uh, of Drupal into SDC, that will cause some big question. And uh, we need to manage it. We need to have testing tools to make, to make sure everything is still working fine. So let's go back to this hero. Yeah, that is this hero. And this is the first version. And this is the second version. And uh, if now that we know that this type of hero can have uh, this type of variant, it can have extra information for the project and the horizon. Uh, we put them together like this, and then we say everything look the same <coughs> except for this one. So this this is where we the, the slot in SDC come into play. Uh, for uh, if you are familiar with SDC, you know that the slot is like uh, an SDC is a black box. You put it in there, it will take care of the render. And we don't need to know about all the internal stuff of this component. But sometimes we need some part of it to be open so that we can change it depending on the context, more flexible. And that is where the slot comes in there. So if we implement the slot, it will look like this. So we have the, uh, this is a bad naming where I just make it up for, for the image of the slide. It should be a C, C on table. But here we have the, uh, the component name here. And then we can pass the order field, like title, which is like same before. We can pass the breaker, we can pass the button over there, like, like in the previous uh, slide. But we will now have the block, which is the slot. So this part here will be overwritten. And in this case, I will just print out the content field text, because this is the context of the paragraph. So in, on, the second, on the second part, on the second hero, it will look similar like that. But in this block here, we have the, uh, we, we can just add more stuff in there. We can add a more uh, markup to divide it into a grid of three column and print out the, the first two. So this is used on the um, template of the paragraph of this type only. So we have more flexibility, but we still keep the one same, same component in there. Uh, so, Let's say we have the legacy project. We build a bunch of components. We test it, but it is on the storybook side. What will happen if we put it into Drupal? What problem will it cause? Like, for sure it will cause some regression because we cut some part, we change some part, we change the dependency, update the CSS, or clean it up a few parts. So we need to make sure that it looks exactly the same as before. But how do we test it? How do we make sure that along three or six months of developing the component library and integrating here, it will not cause any uh, backward um, regression? So we have those problems. And uh, we try to find some solution. The easiest part is we have different environments. <coughs> and whenever we release something, we try to compare it like manually. Uh, with the help of all the editors uh, in the teams. Uh, and they, they can easily spot out some minor change. For example, here, the line here changed it. So this is possible, but it's not sustainable for a big site because that is very laborious. <coughs> then we have implemented their, then we implement their visual regression test tools uh, in this case, we are using uh, Percy, which is a uh, tool from uh, browser stack. Uh, what it does is uh, it will take a screenshot of the whole page. And then the next time that you deploy the new version, it will take a screenshot of that page and then compare it. So for example, in this case, we can see that this is the old version. Uh, this is the old version from Prod, taken one hour ago. It's look like this. And the new version, when we deploy it, the title shift out, and we can highlight it right away. The good thing about uh, Percy is that it can uh, give you the approved the view because some ch sometimes the change that we see in here it's something that we want. For example, we change the light gate for a better visibility of the title. So we can approve it and the next time it will not bother us about this change anymore. Uh, so, 
So that is how the, the visual regression test can help us to identify the problem. But we want to go a bit further and want to run the test and you know, more often. Let's say uh, we before releasing a new, uh, after a sprint, we're releasing a new uh, back with, with has many changes in there. So we configure the, the CI uh, system so that it can trigger the playwright and then trigger the proceed. Uh, for it, if, you are, you know, if you, you are not familiar with that, so Playwright is an open source testing framework, end-to-end -end testing framework written in, in TypeScript. And it's similar to, to Behat or Cypress. Uh, it helps us to, to write behavior testing. So we can write scenario like going to the home page, click on that button, and expect the page to be redirected into some specific page. So we, we have a, a long set of test scenario like this, and then whenever we deploy something, it just will go and check each and every test case like that and make sure that it doesn't break anything. Playwright um, actually comes with a visual regression tool from it from itself. It can take a screenshot of the page, and then the next time it can take another screenshot and compare it. But it runs on the GitLab runner, GitHub runner. So if we have a hundred page or two hundred page or thousand page, the the task to taking the screenshot and diff them together take a lot of time. So it will basically block the CI from running from finishing the task. We don't like it. So we also it into Percy. So basically what it does is a playwright can just send the URL into Percy and Percy will take care of the uh, taking care taking the screenshot. Managing the previous screenshot, do the comparison, as well as providing us a UI dashboard where we can approve it or not. And Percy is also so smart that if we change something in the header, basically it will show the same change in each and every page. But Percy can group them together so that we only need to approve once. So it has so many cool features, and we we try to hook them into our CI system. So whenever we release something, we make sure that. We are in control of those uh, visual shifting that, um, that happen. Uh, so that is the second part, and uh, we are quite confident with the process right now, but they still have some problem. So how, if we bring the component into um, the, the current team, it might break. They might. I'm sure that then we have some case where we forget to uh, some edge case where we forget to, to think about and. I'm sure that we, we fix something and we break something else. And how do we control them? We uh, develop a small tools. It's nothing fancy. It's just a, a true behavior uh, module. Uh, it's what it does. Uh, it will add into each and every paragraph of this. <coughs> it will have a checkbox over here. Comportement uh, in behavior in, in French. Uh, if we, if we develop a paragraph behavior, it will show up in here. So we see the, the, the checkbox over here. Uh, so the editor can go in there and check it. And when they check it, basically it will add a new variable, a Boolean variable in a quick file. And in our quick file, we have, if it just use the SDC, then render it using the new SDC that we develop. If not, just use the old one. Don't touch, don't, don't break anything. So, so we have a conditional rendering uh, system like that. And then we also build a small report. So this is the different type of paragraph that we have. And if we say, OK, in this type of paragraph, there are 211 instances in there. And you already use SDC in one instance. And if we go further, we can see that, OK, it's just using this place. So uh, what we do is we have some editor come and go and check everything uh, quickly and verify if everything is working good. If they just keep checking it, at some point this will go into 100%. And at that point, we are confident in it. And then we can remove this part and just render it using SDC. So, uh, so this is quite laborious, but we feel more confident when slowly roam over into SDC like this. And together with the uh, visual regression test that we implement in CRCD, we have more control. And and, and slowly change the current team into using SDC. It's become much more easier to manage to update those components for us. 
so, uh, so that um, that is pretty much what I want to present today. And uh, what do we think about the component library? So, a component library is it's not uh, the the way to develop using component bases like this. It's not something new. It has been in Drupal for so long. Before we use uh, Python Lab, we use UI Python. And uh, now with SEC, things seem to be easier, but it's the same principle. And outside of Drupal, all the framework like React and Vue already develop component library like this. If we go to React, we have uh, Material UI for React, Bootstrap for UI, uh, React. And when we, when we design our component library, we basically just go in there and cherry pick a few ideas from them. Let's say how they uh, analyze the button, how they analyze the accordion and we try to copy the way that they, have, they, 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 uh, they do it, as well as copy the way that they document the component. Like, this accordion need to have that specific uh, setting for accessibility, for example. So that kind of uh, thing we try to copy from, from everywhere and put it in our component library. And uh, so that's it for my presentation, and thank you. For the naming convention, um, before we only work in between the developer, but actually the bigger big pictures come from, we need to work with the designer. It's them who have the global view on which component they want to add into, into so the system. So designers do decide, is this, is this a component, this is not a component? Uh, half and half. Sometimes they come to us and then we discuss to find the name that can be shared. Because maybe we know that it will be used in other case. It, you know, we know we know some part. They know some part. So we just work together. And if let's say you had a component with a set of fields, and there's uh, a new design item that almost the same but a little bit different, is it you are extending the existing component or are you creating a new one? It's uh, it would really depend. Uh, sometimes I would create a slot like an example, and sometimes if the new prop makes sense. If the new prop can be optional and can be put in there, we can just create a new prop. Yeah, but you still decide with the designers. Yeah, yeah, it's depend. We we want to learn more about the use case and uh, the future use case of the component. And you happen to duplicate components? Uh, uh, do we we try to avoid that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Have you got a nesting at all? A nesting component. Yeah. So similar to what you would do with the slot, like if you wanted to break out that specific piece, like say that could be its own thing, a right? mm -hmm. full blown component, and then in that case, in your slot, you might have like an extension to put a component into a component and use them. In. I think that will cause one problem because when we extend that component, then the component ID that we add together with the attribute. That will be the ID. Yeah, that will yeah. be the ID of the, 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 the component <coughs> that you extend. That will not reflect the name of the component that you are represent, uh, representing here. Are they putting IDs in the top or classes? So it's, it's a data component ID. Yes, okay. the data component ID. It's, uh, So let's say if we have the hero one, and then we create a hero two where we extend the hero one, then this will, uh, when we create the SEC with the hero two, which is the, in the inheritance, it will say hero one. So sometimes it will be a bit misleading. But it's what, yeah, the, the rendering DOM tree uh, will be what you need. It's just a bit un unstructured in that way. So are, are you saying that you're, you're not trying to follow atomic design patterns? With, with this because it becomes too complicated? Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, not really. Uh, it's not against atomic design. Yeah. 
Actually, we follow that. We, we define some atom component, we define some molecule and organism okay. component as well. It's just that we, uh, uh, personally, I would keep them flat rather than grouping, group, grouping them in a different um, uh, folder. <coughs> but I, 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 I do follow that structure as well. Yeah. Yes. Cool. So in your examples for, like this one right here, the, the image and also the link, you were passing those in as uh, properties instead of slots. Yeah. And so like for your link, so are you then pre-processing that to get, like using a link field in Drupal and you pre-process it to be two separate attributes? Or, because I, I had asked in like the channel on uh, how people were doing that, because if you do like the images, mm -hmm. then if you don't let Drupal handle it, then you're losing Drupal's ability to do like a responsive image or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that, that is the, the, the point we, we also discuss a lot in between our team. So uh, we want to use something from Drupal. For example, the image. I will not pass the URL in here just for the demonstration. Mm -hmm. Because with the image, we have the image style. We are, sometimes we use the responsive image. We don't want to lose that. Okay. And then we just pass everything as a prop. And it just went out. Okay. The so it's just for this example. Yeah. I, was like, I was like, is that better for some yeah. reason? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, also the benefit you get is if you're using a component for your image displays, that's a generated component that it's a, its own little piece that you're just sticking in the slot or wherever, wherever yeah. you're passing it through. Yeah. The only problem that um, that we, we we see at that point is that if we define the Drupal rendering string for the image, for example, then when we display it in Storybook it will not show up as an image. It will be just a string. So we need to put a raw filter in that field. It's not nice, but uh, honestly, I don't know how to fix that problem yet. Yes? Uh, do you develop cross projects or cross theme uh, component collections? Uh, and if, if you do, how would you structure them? I uh, actually am um, playing around with um, a small module named uh, CL Tailwind where we build a small set of components based on Tailwind. And the, 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 the uh, ambition that that, that, the, that module does is like you can just install it, and then in your team you will clone that component and then use it right away. And then you can add more CSS variable to tweak it, change it a bit, change the padding, change the color. So that is the goal that, that I'm working on. And I see that there are some other projects other project in Drupal.org, for example, the var-based component, they are building uh, SDC component using Bootstrap, I think. And there's another project which is very cool named Shoelace. So Shoelace is a, a web component uh, framework. So uh, they try to bring it and to build a component library based on the Shoelace. So on the component there will be web component. So this is very cool, but that project is still on the very early day. Right, so uh, you can look in the storybook, there is a toddler for the theme, right, to produce different themes. I'm just trying to kind of figure out how you would manage all that. Uh, would you develop a theme separately in this, let's say, component factory installation, and then develop your collections of components in the same installation and then make it portable into the destination property or something of that sort? So. You know what I'm saying? If let's say you use Bootstrap, right? You would have yeah. overrides to to preview with those overrides if they have to leave on the project, right? Yeah. But then if you decided to use those component, components elsewhere, right? You would have to port the overrides and components to different projects, but maintain them in one in one location oh. just to make sure that they're maintainable both at the same time for different projects oh, okay. and then release management and all that stuff. Yeah, that's a problem that I'm also having yeah. because releasing because they have their their components already set up and then they update them, but you can't really just pull them in. You have to basically create a new theme again, and right. that, yes. that, that it gets clunky that way. Yes. Well, shameless plug. I'm giving a presentation about web components. The thing has to do a lot with what we discuss here. I mean, similar alternative ways of solving. Same problems. Yes, the next one. But I think um, there is um, maybe not the best solution, but um, 
uh, one way to go is like we, we need to pick one CSF framework. For example, we pick um, uh, Tailwind or Bootstrap, and we build component based on that. And then on the team, you can use that, but you can add additional CSS to tweak that component to match with your team. So another layer on top of the component library that you have in here. That can do, but that will have some limitation. Yeah. So we're currently doing a library like that for cross projects. So what we're doing is basically creating the components and adding images or particles for CSS and for that kind of stuff. And those can be tweaked on the corresponding theme for each of the projects. So basically, all the components live like in a module, and then that's what we pull. And then when we call them, we pass. That's that's what we're trying to do. We call them transparent components, kind of. Yeah. Uh, try to attach to what you know. Couple from the CSS properties. Exactly. Just classes to identify these. Yeah, that's that's what we're doing correctly as well. It's a lot, yeah. of, a lot of things we have to go into that. Thank you. Have, have you played with the storybook module, the new one that just came out? It lets you write your story in a twig. I I saw it in the chat, but I couldn't uh, play with it yet. Yeah, yeah it's, it, it, in my it, list. Yeah. It, it makes it easy since you are already writing in twig. Instead of having to do it in JSX or uh, oh. you know, the, uh, what was CL Server was trying to do it all in JSON, yeah. and, and it, it was horrible. Uh, but but this is it's by the same guys. So yeah, yeah. Great, so I I would recommend it. Yeah, I would try it for sure. Thank you. Storybook. Oh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, right. I just wanted to ask you on the visual regression testing. I had Cypress and went down this route, but I ended up finding the majority of my time was. Um, you know, what it caught, which is one pixel off things. And mm -hmm. is that just tool? Have you found a, a big success with Percy? I haven't tried that, but I just found the visual regression hasn't really caught any huge visual bugs, and I'm most of the time fighting yeah. or approving minor little things that don't have a real big impact. So what's your experience with that visual regression? We, uh, we like it. You we like use, it? Yeah, we, uh, we use it in um, each and every release. And last time it were able to cut the Lihe shifting that I uh, mentioned, which has changed like uh, one pixel or something, and it, it, it can flag it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we, we use uh, Diffy, which yeah, was actually Diffy. created by a Drupal uh, community Diffy. member. And what's special about Diffy that others don't have is when one pixel shifts down or anything does that, it understands that it's not everything changed, but just mark only the change instead of the whole page. Yes. Diffy, I'm sorry? Yeah. It's D I F F Y dot website okay. with a domain. I think the thing I was using with Cypress, and like my base screenshot would be 399 pixels, that would be 400 pixels wide, and it would mark it as fail. And, yeah. and I spent a lot of battling that kind of stuff. But. That's cool. Yeah. Thank you. Any question? Are there? Thank you for coming today. <laughs>